Don't be a masochist like me. Don't do this. In case you're new to the channel, I recently bought a new 2022 Ducati Panigale B4. The bike rolled off the truck on Friday, the dealer prepped it that afternoon, and I picked it up on Saturday. Because I had a crazy idea to ride the bike from LA to Austin for MotoGP weekend, which just happened to be that following weekend. So that gave me two and a half days to break it in so I can get the first service done. So if I wasn't eating, sleeping, or working, I was pretty much on that bike, putting on the 600 break-in miles so I can get it serviced on Tuesday before I left for Texas on Wednesday. Now my advice to anyone out there is, don't be a masochist like me, don't do this. If you are the kind of rider who takes a lot of long trips, don't get a sport bike. There are many, many better bikes that are suited for a long trip than a sport bike. Get a GS. Get a Multistrada, get a Tracer, get a Tiger Sport, get an NT1100. There are so many better options out there than a sport bike. Get one of those bikes if you are that kind of rider. I am not that kind of rider who does long trips all the time. 99% of my riding is commutes, canyons, coastal rides. So for the 1% of the time where I'm taking a long trip, I am willing to tough it out on a sport bike. It's not a big deal for me. Also, I am on a sport bike almost every day of the week, so I am very used to it. I am very comfortable on a sport bike. And I've taken a few motorcycle road trips, almost all of them, on sport bikes, so I knew what I was in for. LA to Vegas, LA to Mexico, LA to San Francisco, LA to the Grand Canyon, although I did that one on the Triumph. And the big one, after I graduated, Michigan to California on a sport bike. So this is not my first trip to the rodeo. Now, besides the break-in service, the only thing I did before leaving for Texas is take off the wings because, you know, not a fan. And I gotta say, just covering that spot temporarily with electrical tape looks way better, in my opinion. And yes, it does look a little bit like my bike has an old-timey mustache. And no, I don't care because I still think it looks 10 times better than with wings. And besides that, the Panigale comes standard with a battery tender line already connected. Thank you, Ducati. So all I needed to do was buy a USB connector so I could power my phone for the GPS, and I was good to go. That's it. That's all I did before I rode out. So a friend asked me what gave me the idea to take my bike halfway across the country to Austin for MotoGP. Well, I actually flew out there in 2019 for MotoGP weekend. Had a great time, Texas is awesome. And one of the things I like to do when I go to these bike events is to just walk through the parking lot because you can see all the cool bikes that people bring out that you would usually never see on your day-to-day -day rides. And something that I noticed is that although the majority of the bikes there had Texas plates, there were a ton of bikes there from out of state from people who'd ridden in for the weekend. There were bikes from Louisiana and Kentucky and Oklahoma and Colorado and Mexico. And I happened to see this one guy getting off a bike with a California plate. And of course I had to walk over and ask him about it. And coincidentally enough, he was getting off a Ducati. It was an 1198. And it turns out he rode that bike from San Diego to Austin over the course of four days. And with all due respect, he looked to be in his early 60s. And for the record, I also plan to be riding sport bikes still when I get that age. But I thought, um, I'm nowhere near retirement age. If he can do it, I can do it. Challenge accepted. So he's telling me some things about his trip and the wheels were starting to turn in my head and I thought, one day, I'm gonna try this. Fast forward a few years, global pandemic, blah 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 the world shuts down, blue bitty blue that day is here. And a couple people have asked, why didn't I take the F3 or the F4? To be honest, since I got the new engine on the F3, it has been working perfectly. So far, so good. But I've started to get a few messages from people with F3s with new black engines, and their valves have snapped too. So I just don't trust that it's gonna get me to Texas and back. And I think maybe the worst case scenario is your bike breaking down in the deserts of Arizona in 100 degree heat. 
so I just didn't want to chance it. So how about taking the F4? The F4 has been one of the most reliable bikes I have ever had in my life. I have no doubt that it would make it there and back. The thing about the F4 is that the ergonomics are aggressive. So I think by the time I got to Texas, my body would just be wrecked. And the other thing about the F4 is that the cooling system is not great. The bike would probably overheat going through the desert because it struggles after only 30 minutes of 90 degree heat in LA. So I can only imagine how tough it would be for that bike to do four or five hours of Arizona desert heat. So I'd have to time it so that I did all of the desert riding at night when it's 20 degrees cooler and then sleep during the day. And I just didn't want to do that. So Ducati it is. And that drive through the southwest part of the country is just amazing. Everyone should do that drive because you will see some really beautiful scenery. Yeah, I was honestly looking forward to the ride. So the only way I can make this work, because my job is kind of crazy right now, and I absolutely had to be back to work the Monday after the race, is if I rode the bike to Texas, and then right after the race, parked it in my cousin's garage, who luckily happens to live in Austin, and then fly back to LA, and then fly back to Texas a few weeks later to ride the bike back. Luckily, because of the pandemic, I have racked up a lot of miles and haven't been able to use them, so the flights will be free. So I had a somewhat complicated plan, but at least it was a plan. Now, LA to Austin is roughly about 21 hours on the road. So the plan was work a half day Wednesday, be on the road by two, do eight hours, which would get me to Tucson, then do the remaining 13 hours the next day to get me to Austin. I'd get to the hotel by midnight, get a good night's sleep, and be up for free practice one Friday morning. Because I'm a bike nerd and I don't want to miss any of the action. Well, the first problem with the trip popped up before I even left. Someone on the team that I work with ended up quitting the day that I was supposed to leave early. So cue many unplanned meetings with managers melting down and rearranging work. So instead of cutting out early and getting on the road by 2, I ended up staying late and didn't get on the road till 10 p.m. Yeah, not a great start to the trip. So for that first leg, it was really only reasonable to get to Phoenix, which is six hours away. Of course you would expect a brand new bike to run flawlessly, and it did. There were no problems. But one of the things that popped up early on that I really wished the bike had was a gas gauge. It's 2022! We're landing space probes on asteroids, but I still can't get a gas gauge on my motorcycle? You are killing me, Ducati! For some reason, they insist on using that ridiculous low fuel light system that's been on bikes since forever. I've seen bikes from the 80s with that system. All the technology on this bike, I know they can do better. It feels like I'm back in junior high. Okay, your tank holds four and a half gallons. You've gone 95 miles and you're getting approximately 40 miles to the gallon. How much further can you go? I don't wanna feel like I'm back in eighth grade math class. Give me a gas gauge. So you really have to pay attention to your fuel and how much you're burning because you do not want to run out of gas in the middle of the desert. Now, the Panigale is an infamously hot bike. Since I did all my riding at night for that first leg and the temperatures got a little cooler, the heat wasn't that bad. And almost 400 miles later, I roll into Phoenix at about 4 a.m. Sleepy and tired. Which now means, in order to make it to Austin, I'd have to do about 15 hours of riding to make it the remaining 1,000 miles. In other words, an iron butt. 1,000 miles in a day. Which is, let's just say, an ambitious goal. Day two. I get a late start out of Phoenix around noon. Because I got in so late the morning before. Because I left LA so late the night before. So it's really a domino effect of lateness that really screwed up my schedule. And it was about 92 degrees as I was leaving Phoenix. So a toasty start to the day as I was heading across the deserts. So I had all of one mechanical hiccup with the bike the entire trip. The temperature was about 95 degrees when I pulled over in Tucson for a gas stop. And the bike stalled once at a red light.
but it started right up again and I didn't have any other problems for the rest of the trip. So I'm gonna give it a pass on this one. The bike was heat soaked, just like me. Then my schedule takes another hit about 30 minutes past Tucson when the traffic starts to slow down to a crawl and then stop. Traffic is at a standstill. And here I am, full motorcycle gear, full face helmet, leather jacket, boots, gloves, on a Panigale, a very hot bike, and the air temperature is 95 degrees at this point. So I am slow roasting like a Thanksgiving turkey. Traffic is barely moving. And I couldn't lane split because in case you didn't know, lane splitting is currently only legal in one state in America, and that state is California which is one of the great things about having a bike in California. So any other state in America, you could get a ticket if you lane split. Not in Arizona. Yeah, it's legal in California, but not in Arizona. So I am just melting, hating life. And I'm realizing I may not be making it to Austin by the end of this leg. So traffic is just crawling slowly. And after about an hour, we've gone two miles. So I'm thinking, should I just lane split and get a ticket? Or should I get heat stroke and pass out on the freeway? Neither great options. And I am just about to lane split as we finally get up to the problem. A car has caught fire and started a brush fire. A brush fire in the desert. Yeah, weird. So finally we passed that back up, but I know that has really killed my time. I don't think I'm gonna make free practice one Friday morning because I still had many, many more miles to go. Thankfully, I made good time through New Mexico, and the temperatures got a few degrees cooler, like maybe upper 80s instead of mid 90s. So that gave my body a little time to cool down after being slow baked in Arizona. So no drama for that state, besides my environmental impact study, RIP New Mexico bugs. And I finally crossed the Texas border about midnight. Hallelujah, I am finally in Texas. Once you roll into El Paso, your mind is telling you you're almost there. You're in the same state, it's gotta be the home stretch, right? But you're not at all almost there. <laughs> Texas is a huge state. And El Paso to Austin, which is roughly halfway across the state, is still another eight hours. No! Oh! Yes. Thank you. Sure. 
So at this point, I'm roughly 12 hours into this leg of the trip, and I'm starting to feel it. I'm kind of feeling like I don't want to be on the bike anymore. So part of me, the masochistic part of me, says, let's just power through and get to Austin. Seven more hours, I can do that. The other part of me, the sane part, just wants to get a nice bed in a hotel and lay down. Maybe I should just call it a night. So what do I do? Of course I try to power through it. It's only 1 a.m., why not? So this gets into the second rough part of the day, after that long traffic backup outside of Tucson. Because as I was crossing those western plains of Texas, and it's starting to get later and later in the early morning, that fancy TFT dash on the V4 is telling me the outside temperature. And that temperature is dropping, and dropping, and dropping. It drops from the 80s, into the 70s, into the 60s, into the 50s, then into the 40s. And my hands are starting to get numb. My whole body is starting to get cold from the wind chill. And I am just starting to shiver. And curse Ducati for not having heated grips be standard on this bike. So I'm riding and riding, just shivering my way across the western part of Texas. And what happens at around 3 a.m.? the temperature dips to 39 degrees. And the bike throws up an icon, which I had not seen before. A little yellow road with what looked to be an X on it, but actually turned out to be a snowflake because it was giving me an ice warning. So maybe the universe is trying to tell me something, that it's time to call it a night. (laughs) And that's exactly what I decide to do at around 4 a.m. again for the second night in a row, pulling over about three and a half hours outside of Austin in wonderful Ozona, Texas, population 2,731. So to recap, I started the day almost getting heat stroke in the deserts of Arizona and ended the day 770 miles later, almost getting frostbite, riding through the western plains of Texas. A very extreme day. So I'm not going to make free practice one, which is very disappointing to the bike nerd part of me. But the rational, I want to survive this trip part of me is relieved. The next day was a breeze. So easy. I got on the road around noon and only had to do around 230 miles to get to Austin. Texas is a super cool state. So riding through it was a blast. And it was nice to just ride in the daytime after doing all those miles at night. It was nice to ride during the day. You could actually see some of the Texas scenery. All the pastures and Texas cattle just grazing in fields off the side of the road. Just things you do not see in LA. And that final leg was nice because I could actually relax and appreciate the scenery a little more since I wasn't stressing out about making good time. And I finally got into Austin around 3.30. So 1,400 miles covered in about 39 hours. Not bad. So if you're wondering how the bike held up, there were no problems, which is what you would expect from a brand new bike. Ergonomically, I'm not going to try and tell you it would be a comfortable ride for most people. It's a sport bike, not a gold wing. After an hour, I'd be wiggling around on my seat for a little bit, trying to get comfortable. But then 20 minutes later, I'd have to pull over for gas anyway, and I could stretch my legs then. So it wasn't a big deal for me. And again, I am on a sport bike almost every day of the week, and therefore I am very used to it. So the ergonomics did not bother me at all. But most sane people, I would say to them, don't do this. Now the heat, the heat. Again, the V4 Panigales are notoriously hot bikes, but maybe because I was constantly moving during this trip and not in stop and go traffic, except for that one time in Arizona when the freeway got shut down. And also because I did so much of my riding at night when it's cooler, it was hot, but not torture. 
which is what I was kind of afraid it would be. But it has definitely unseated the F4 as the hottest bike I have ever ridden. So be prepared if you're thinking of getting one. Mileage wise, I had the bike dialed down to street mode so I could get better gas mileage. So that gives you roughly 150 horsepower instead of the bananas 200 horsepower of the sport mode. So my fuel mileage was usually between 38 and 40 miles a gallon. So when I was deciding on getting a new bike, my final two choices really came down to an S1000 or a V4. And obviously I went for the V4. So out of the three nice to haves that it's missing compared to an S1000, gas gauge, cruise control, and heated grips, the thing I wish it had the most was a gas gauge. That would have made the trip a little less stressful. And I know they can't add a fuel gauge at this point, but it would be really nice if Ducati added an estimated miles till empty line on the dash. They could very easily do that tomorrow with a software update with just a few lines of code because the dash already tells you what your fuel mileage is and they know when you trigger the low fuel light so they could easily tell you, okay, you've been riding at 45 miles a gallon so far. You've now tripped the low fuel sensor. So now you can go another 38 miles. That would be seriously helpful. If anyone at Ducati is listening, they're not listening. That would be such an awesome update to the dash. Secondly, cruise control. That would have been nice to have, just so I can give my right wrist a rest by shaking it out. Heated grips would have been nice to have, but not, yeah, not a huge priority. I only wish I had heated grips for those few early morning hours in Texas, so I didn't really miss that all that much. But that's something you can add aftermarket, so I could always get that later. And finally, one more time, don't do this. I would advise you, if you're the kind of rider who does a lot of long trips, get a different kind of motorcycle. There are a ton of bikes out there that are better suited for this kind of thing than a sport bike. But for me, someone who's on a sport bike almost every day and is very used to it, I had a blast. That Panigale was awesome and I had so much fun and I would totally do that again. And in case you're curious what my final mileage count was after owning the bike for eight days, it was 2092 when I left it in my cousin's garage before I flew back to LA. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So stay tuned to this channel for more of the trip when I have to ride the bike back from Texas to California. Oh yeah, and there was a race.